Yeah. So first, let's start about what this workshop isn't going to be, because the thing is that branding is a very broad topic. Um, and the thing is, is that, uh, you know, when a client comes and signs on for a rally branding project, it can take anywhere from two to six months. Obviously, yeah. we don't have that time, right? We have a little over an hour. Um, so we're not going to be going over things like logo design or creating specific taglines, because that by itself is not a brand. Um, you can't just create a logo and a tagline and slap it on everything that please, you make. Please, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Uh, <laughs> because it's not creating, you know, an overall uh, like thematic unity. It's not pushing your organization's story forward. There's no cohesiveness to it. Instead, our focus is going to be on three things today. The first one is going to be defining your brand. Um, basically, it's going to we're going to walk through ways to sort of rediscover your brand's voice uh, so that you sound more authentic to the people you're trying to connect with. And we're going to go over learning to create content and sort of the creative process. So turning that voice into a song, if you can imagine. Um, and then finally, speaking the creative language. And uh, what that means is how to collaborate with creative people so that what we figured out in the first two steps, you can continue to do uh, after this um, presentation. And uh, I like to think of it as like, okay, we got the song, now let's form a band. Yeah, so there's going to be a lot of singing. Uh... No, just kidding. There's no singing. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. <laughs> um, so to start, we're going to focus on on your brand and sort of reimagining it uh, in a new light, just as a creative exercise. And we really want to um, dial in how exactly your customer views you. So it's going to allow us to kind of step away from how you're currently viewing your brand and your organization um, and what it means to be a brand. And we really want to focus on the customer's perspective on on your your product, your service and your overall brand identity. Yeah, and a good way to practice, you know, like how your customer views you is for you to view a brand. So we're gonna start with talking about uh, Patagonia. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. Yeah, that's how you say it. Oh, thank God, that would have been really <laughs> embarrassing. Um, so yeah, feel free to, um, we meant to mention this earlier, but yeah, we wanted to hear you guys. This is a workshop. We wanna hear you guys talk and like chat and everything. So when we ask these questions, just even if we don't see them, just chat. That's a let's, let's start a conversation. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, how does this brand make you feel? You know, um, Michael, how do you feel about this brand? So, I guess when I look at this this brand specifically, the logo that's that's on this yeah, piece of clothing, you know, I, I notice immediately the colors in the background. Actually, yeah, that's a super and cool color scheme. Yeah, it kind of yeah. looks like a, almost like there's yeah. a sun that's setting or something. Almost like it almost feels like you just finished a hike, right? Yeah. And you're looking at like Whoa. off a cliff face or something, but it's also kind of got this retro appeal. Like I feel like I could find it in like my grandpa's closet, yeah. but that it would still be in like yeah, it's pristine condition. Yeah, it's timeless. Yeah. I mean, it's coming timeless. from a, a graphic standpoint, the font is is pretty pretty timeless. That's They picked a good font in the beginning. That doesn't really have to be changed too much. Exactly. Um, so if this was a person. Yeah, um, what, what word do you describe, uh, use to describe them, Alex? Um, Hiker. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Someone who's probably like really hardworking and adventurous. You know, like they they take the time to go and and uh, and and enjoy nature and like preserve it. You know, that's kind of the kind of person I think about when I think of someone wearing this brand or associated with it for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, I just immediately think of my friends who <laughs> own a hundred plus carabiners and. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that friend who has a carabiner on his keychain. Yeah, and he's yeah. <laughs> always trying to convince me with a, a, an enthusiasm to go hiking with him. You know, uh, like I, I think of that sort of enthusiasm. We actually have some friends who invited us to go camping, and uh, we're gonna do it, but we we gotta get worked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's take that a little further, though. Like when we think about that person, you know, our friend who likes to go hiking or invite us to go hiking. You know, what do they look or sound like? Um, and again, looking at like the Patagonia brand. Yeah. I mean, obviously they're wearing Patagonia, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but more, more so than that, they're, they're probably like super energetic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think I, to me, it's somebody who, I mean, I, I imagine boots on like yeah. just for whatever reason, I mean, you need that to go hiking, but I also imagine that they're probably like tan, right. And maybe a little like a little muscular to find, right. Because they live an outdoor lifestyle as far as what they sound like. I think they're probably pretty laid back. I don't think of... You know what? I think they can speak the creative language. 
<laughs> please, please so this that. is sort of you know how, how we want uh, you guys to, to approach your own brand yeah. or whenever you're taking on a branding project, right? Is to really dial in the elements and, and the personifying um, aspects of you know a design um, of what a brand actually is and sort of the feelings that it invokes. I don't know if y'all can see the Q&A, but Julianne says granola vibes for Patagonia. Oh, granola vibes. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Wow. You just made a whole tagline. For Are you me. a marketer? Do you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, now I want granola. Okay. <laughs> so this is the step where we need to reimagine your brand. Um, to start, we're going to need to better define your organization's goals and how you plan to achieve them. Uh, when we work with clients at Rally on Branding Podrex, one of the first things we ask them is like, what have you already accomplished in terms of branding? Usually their first response is something like we have a logo or tagline or you know we got matching shirts and it's like, <laughs> again it's like okay that's but like what do you really do you know what are you and you know the next question we usually ask them is like what are your goals and it's almost always what well, we want to grow business and increase sales and in terms of branding yeah that is not a goal yeah. right i don't buy a product to help somebody increase their sales that's never part of my purchasing decision yeah instead with respect to branding, increased sales and revenue, it's a consequence of reaching goals successfully. Um, so on the next few slides, we're gonna kind of walk through like really defining your goals. And we want you guys to step away from thinking about purely the financial aspects of this, right? Because that's not what makes people buy things. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna start actually with an exercise to kind of help you reimagine your brand. And to start, we're gonna start with the core. So when you think of your organization's primary purpose, like take a step a step back from how you think it, like you're perceived, like what do you what do you think your organization's primary purpose is? Um, or in other words, like if your brand was a person, like why would they wake up in the morning? You know? Yeah. Um, what gets them out of bed? Yeah. There's um, exploring spirituality, leaving a legacy, pursuing a connection, and providing structure. And about exploring spirituality, that's not necessarily uh, religious. It can mean like, you know, attaining higher knowledge, yeah. seeking things that are greater than yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, as we go through this process, I think that that's one section that will kind of be more clarified. But uh, so don't look at it as purely religious. That's like seeking things that are bigger than yourself. Yeah. OK, so um, also you guys should probably be taking notes during this point, not to mention that earlier. Yeah, but... make sure whatever, whatever <laughs> one of these that you pick, yeah. right, because we want you to pick one that you make note of it. Yeah, it, it, it'll make sense. Um, so going from this point in your quadrant, I want you guys to we want you guys to pick a descriptive quality that um, that like uh, like how your brand achieves its purpose. So. If you're, let's say you're in the explore spirituality um, quadrant, which one of the three freedom, understanding, and safety descriptors would would your brand use to achieve its purpose? Um, so, like, basically, how it address and how would like if your brand was a person, how would it dress and what, what would it say? About what, what would it say? Um, so, so like a way of looking at this, right? We we're just talking about exploring spirituality. Is like, well, spirituality can be a broad thing, right? It might be that they pursue freedom. And the mm -hmm. things that they do your, your brand really wants uh to to be defined by their freedom or they want to be defined by higher understanding or they want to be defined by the way that they invoke safety mm -hmm. so before we go on it laurel mentioned that there were questions if i'm missing any if we're missing any questions laurel um i'll, I'll call you out oh cool, cool. yeah That's call us out laurel so, uh, i'll take care of you don't worry <laughs> also we never introduced laurel we love laurel this is laurel <laughs> Um, she's great. She's going to be letting us know what y'all say. Um, back to it. Okay. Um, and from here, you guys are actually going to find your brand archetype. So if you were to, let's say your brand um, was very focused on freedom, um, your archetype is the explorer. And Michael's actually going to talk more about uh, archetypes. Yeah. So why are these archetypes important and why do you need to associate your brand with one? Yeah. Uh, it serves two purposes, uh, connection and differentiation. Uh, the, the reason that connection is is an aspect of this is that humans, we naturally understand storytelling. It's the oldest form of communication, even before the written word. And there's been a lot of studies that have shown that storytelling tends to follow very, um, it's formulaic. There, there are certain models of storytelling that are the exact same. You know, you just change out the elements. And within that, the characters follow very specific archetypes. 
the nice thing about associating your brand with an archetype is that when we look at you know the description of an explorer or an outlaw, uh, in our heads, we already have assumptions about those characteristics that define an archetype. Uh, the nice thing is that because that's a thing, half the work is really already done for you. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Differentiation exists within the archetypes. So there's a big difference between a sage, right, and a jester, or someone who's innocent and a lover. Well, you say someone, but when you, he mean, like, we mean brands. Right, right. Like, I personally, jester, okay? We know. But, you know, my brand, my more, I, I more lean, t- lean towards, like, a magician. Like, I like to leave a legacy, like, my, my personal brand. Um, like when I do freelance graphics, but yeah, but yeah, but it is fun to think of these people. I mean, these brands are these archetypes as people. So at this point, you should take note of your your core, the word that describes how you achieve that, and then your brand archetype. Yeah, because we're going to be referring to this in the in the yeah. throughout the slide. And uh, these are actually some. This is a flower, <laughs> <laughs> but really, this is a, uh, these are examples of specific of uh, like popular brands that actually fall into these categories um so dove uh innocence you know they they value safety and um like inner beauty and you know you guys recognize all these brands um mtv being out law is just so silly but it's true yeah i just love i love mtv <laughs> so seeing like the brands associated with archetypes really helps to, to give it more context and i mean like I think of like M and M's and you know like the, mm-hmm. the talking M and M's. Like, of course, it's a gesture yeah, thing, exactly. right? Yeah. Or like Nike, they are heroes. Mm-hmm. So, and these are actually good brands that you guys can go and like look at their, their how they present themselves on to other people and maybe take note. Don't mimic Dyson, you know. But like, <laughs> I mean, we'll know, okay. But like, feel free to go take notes about like how they perceive other people and how they perceive themselves. Um, and we actually have a few more. Uh, we wanted to break it down a little bit more on this next slide, um, talking about like specific descriptions um, that, by, your archetype. by your archetype. So like if you're working with a creative, maybe these are the words that you bring up. Like if you go up to a graphic designer and be like, um, I did Michael Alex workshop and I'm a magician, they're going to look at you like you're a psycho. Right, but if you right. go to a magician, a magician, if you go to a graphic <laughs> designer and you say, um, my brand really focuses on being reassuring and keep, make, keeping people informed, but also having like kind of this mystical quality. Right. Uh, like Disney is another magician archetype, just for reference. Yeah. Um, so if you guys pulled one of these six, maybe take a screenshot to use for later as well. Yeah. Uh, and so take a second right now to to make note of, of your words if you haven't already. <laughs> I'm so laughing. I'm just... <laughs> Graphic designers are, are magicians. I mean, I guess we are me. magicians. I don't, yeah. I don't know how you guys do it. <laughs> Um, and then the other six are right here. Um, so, you know, like we talk about a ruler, which is a little hard to conceptualize because it's like, what brand is a ruler? I mean, we said like Rolex, right? Well, Rolex is definitely refined, articulate, and commanding, right? Like a Rolex will never not be a Rolex. If you see somebody wearing a Rolex, it says a lot about them. Or they right? think it does. Or they think it does. Because the brand did its job. Because the brand did its job. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so another one that's that's worth bringing up is lover, right? That's another one. It's like, well, I don't know if I want to be in love with the brand, but it's not really about that, right? It's about being like sensual, like and invoking senses and feelings, mm-hmm. uh, empathetic or soothing. Yeah. So very much in tune with 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 feelings and and perceptions and stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. And so we have some examples of how these archetypes are used by using some of the brands that we had uh, showed you guys earlier. I'm really excited to hear what your archetypes are. But we're going to talk about those later. Yeah, please feel free to drop some of that stuff in, yeah, in the chat. Yeah, because I would I would love to hear uh, the different varieties. Um, but yeah, let's talk about these archetypes in use. You might recognize this brand. It's Mimims, <laughs> <laughs> or as I say in the professional world, Mimims. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is actually a jester archetype. Um, we know them from the it, literally their product is talking. Like they're silly, they eat each other, whatever mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> it's it's terrifying, but also hilarious. Um, and then as most clowns are, <laughs> and then our, like, uh, the comparing, uh, archetype is actually Google very serious, but also like minimal, like from a design standpoint, um, the one before was very colorful and engaging. This one is more like you, you, if you go to Google, you have something in mind, you know, you, you have a truth you're looking for. Um, so they don't want to distract you with a lot of like 
bells and whistles, you know, they want you to go there for knowledge, assurance and guidance. So that, that that's a really good example of like showing like the completely different brands, but but narrowing it down to just their archetypes. Right, right. <laughs> so the next one we have is Nike. And this one is Instagram. Yeah, uh, so yeah. We're, we're switching platforms now to show how it's applied in something like a social feed, right? Yeah. Um, because one of the things we want to reiterate in this uh, in this workshop is that a brand isn't just how you design something. It is a collection of content that reinforces your organization's story, their purpose, all the things that we discussed in those archetypes. Nike is very much a, a hero um, archetype. Uh, the words that describe them, honest, candid, and brave, specifically on the last one, uh, Nike is not afraid to make political stances no. um, ahead of the curve. Black Lives Matter, they were one of the first people to endorse that. Uh, Colin Kaepernick, they were one of the first people to pick him up as a sponsor. Um, they're doing things that other companies would see as risky. And because of that, consumers know. They know that it's like, oh, they're endorsing Black Lives Matter. That's not, you know, that's yeah. Nike being Nike. They're uncensored with like their honesty, which, and they're, and they're resp like respectful with it. Right. And as from a visual standpoint too, you know, you see that they're adding, like it's focused on the peoples. Yeah. On, on like the heroes of, of sport world and stuff like that. Also just people in general, like they celebrate humanity, which is really exciting. And Apple does a pretty similar thing, but they are the creator archetype. And actually, all of almost all of uh, Apple's Instagram posts, I think, I think they're like made by other people. Yeah, it's hashtag shot on an iPhone. Oh. And uh, if you if you post on Instagram with hashtag shot on an iPhone, they add it to their feed. Yeah. So they um, Apple's a bit of a different brand from Nike, but other than celebrating like people, they celebrate like creation, creation. and they want things that are. Uh, inspirational and daring and provocative, you know, like these bright colors, but they're still celebrating people, but in a more like creative. Uh, yeah, it's the dynamic. products that people produce. Yeah. And they're saying through our products, they are creating something. Yeah. So I, I, I think we all like Apple. Um, so the next thing we're going to focus on, because, you know, we kind of have this idea or hopefully uh, if you've been following along, you have an idea of what the brand archetype is and uh, where they fit into that. Um, but like I said earlier, like a brand isn't just what you envision it to be, right? You have to create content that pushes that vision forward. Um, you absolutely can and should spend a lot of time on understanding your brand and defining it like we were doing in the first stage. But because of the length of our workshop, um, we're hoping that, you know, you have a strong enough idea at least to move forward with these exercises. Um, and the first exercise we have. Something we can all relate to, maybe if you're old enough, is I spy. <laughs> So actually with your, we wanted to do this fun thing um, with your archetype in mind. Um, this is why we wanted you to keep and your track brand. and your brand in mind. What would your brand, if it was a person like from this image, what would they grab and put in their pocket? Like, yeah, if, what speaks to them? And it can be something yeah. that, you know, they're just like, oh, I just like this object or it can have a deeper meaning. You know, that that's up to you to decide. Um, but just take a minute and kind of go yeah. through this. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just let you guys meander about while we also meander. Yeah, I'm partial to the the corn clown. Of course you are. The and, corn and clown. The right. <laughs> if, hey, look, if you, sell, if you sell corn, you can slap that on a label. Okay, and... I'm, I'm sold. <laughs> I do love the corn clown. Okay, I gave you I gave you help for it, but it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> the guy on the surfboard looks like he, you know, rocks in Patagonia. <laughs> yeah. I guess Patagonia, that would be a good one for Patagonia. Uh, and if you guys want to post some of some of your objects in the chat, you know, just so we can we can talk yeah, about them do, a little bit. Is there, is there anyone who doesn't know what this is? Because uh, like this is something I, I did when I was a kid. It's, it's just a book when you have to find certain things in the image. But I'm I'm just assuming. Let's see if people. Um, we have one. Julianne would have grabbed the pink fish. Ooh, the pink oh, fish. I see it. Yeah. Right in the middle. So why the pink fish? I'd actually like to know about that one. Yeah. If you don't mind sharing. Yeah. I mean, and, and maybe what the brand is too. Yeah. yeah. That'd be fun. I like that. We're calling you out. <laughs> That's this kind of workshop, I guess. Yep. Oh, she says it's cute and it's probably squishy. And I personally, <laughs> you know I can identify with that. <laughs> I agree. I agree that both those qualities. <laughs> Well, I mean, those are just two very fun words, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that your archetype or at least your brand or whatever you have in mind is probably you're building something that's very fun and carefree and light, you know. She cool. owns a face and body business, Julie's Coffee House. Okay. And she had her, said her archetype earlier was the jester. Very good. I was about to say that feels like a very much a jester yeah. uh, object. 
Yeah, but so that's ahead, a, not about fish, right? Because yeah. I don't want to associate fish with coffee, but it's, <laughs> no, it's what it's the not, fish represents. Not, I think it's it feels friendly. It yeah. feels friendly. Mm -hmm. I'd be friends with that fish. <laughs> Facts. Michael would be friends with that fish. That's a cool fish, man. Uh, all right. Anyway, okay, okay. Back on topic. <laughs> So again, good content strengthens your brand identity. When your audience views content that makes sense to them, they are able to better connect with your brand and will interact with it in more meaningful ways. Like a squishy um, fish. Like a squishy fish. <laughs> uh, the thing, like the ad on the right is like the, the one of the best ads ever, ever created. Um, and it was something that really put Apple like out of the curve going into, um, into this time period of like modern advertising and stuff. Uh, the reason being is that at the time, a lot of people were putting out MP3 players and focusing on, okay, it has this much storage, you know, 500 megabytes or whatever at the time. Uh, you can put MP3s on it and, you know, it's portable and it's like, okay, but like, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. And um, Apple introduced their iPod as, say hello to iPod, 1,000 songs in your pocket. Um, says everything you need to say. Which right? is super funny to think of now, yeah. by the way. That's more, that's yeah. more songs that I think most people, you know, yeah. Have ever listened to. Yeah, rather so than it feels saying, infinite, right? Yeah. But it's it's easy to conceptualize. Um, so and, and that's the thing. Every piece of content you create should further reinforce your brand's overall identity and push your organization's story forward. Mm -hmm. So through this advertisement, um, Apple's also making a statement about their organization, right? They're they're a little understated, right? They don't need to overpromise anything. Um, the thing that they are promising you is that, hey, you're gonna have a huge library of songs in your pocket. And it's it's simple. It matches the aesthetics of their their products. Um, so it, it's really important when we're moving forward to understand that every single piece of content you create is part of your branding. Um, so what what does the content consist of? Oh, this is where we sing. This is this is yeah. You know, this, <clears throat> we've been practicing on harmonies. <laughs> we haven't. I think no. everyone would leave. Yeah, um, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at its core, every piece of content you create is going to focus on, it's going to include some sort of consideration of words and some sort of consideration of visuals. Even if you choose to not have any words or not have any visuals, that still involves a decision that balances both of those aspects. Um, a good way of looking at this is that words are the bones of your brand. Good writing will clarify abstract ideas and reduce confusion for potential customers. Think about if you've ever bought a product online and it got shipped to you and it was different than what you ordered. Right. It just didn't like it was perhaps bigger, the wrong size, whatever it is. You don't go to the image and say, oh, this doesn't match the image. No, you go to the, the product specifications or mm -hmm. you go to the description. Right. Because it's concrete. It's taking, you know, that frustration you're feeling and saying, well, this is why I feel frustrated. Uh, the inverse of that, you know, it's like if I like something, it's like, oh, I like it because it's a thousand songs in my pocket. Uh, so basically words offer concrete, definite inter interpretations of visual elements. Uh, to assist your audience in better understanding your brand's core values and intent. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of that, on the pink side of that, <laughs> um, visuals uh, are the face of your brand. You know, good visual branding will highlight the strongest aspects of your organization. Um, and we we joke earlier saying like, don't just put a logo and a and a catchphrase on something, but like that is still very important. The, it's the right. first thing people see. Um, before they read it. Um, visuals help provide context to the words of your message. And when working together, let's go, uh, <laughs> we'll create a fully fleshed out idea that guides uh, customer interaction. And it's important to understand that, you know, good content, it is when these two elements work together, right? If you put too much effort into the words, but not the visuals, won't be as, as good and vice versa. So content is a very well-rounded thing. Um, and we'll kind of go into that later about how you create that well-rounded experience. But first, we're going to focus on um, sort of like the basics of writing copy. Uh, these are things that I've learned. I got it. Just, just kidding. <laughs> I don't got it. You go. <laughs> uh, these, are th these are things that we've learned, you know, over, at least I've learned over the years, uh, writing copy. Um, I'm sure that this is stuff that's been said before, but mm -hmm. uh, for a beginner, this is really good advice to just keep in mind. And the first one being, it's not always what you say, but how you say it voice and tone should always be your starting point. Uh, it's much, much harder to write good copy when you start with like, okay, I'm gonna list out a product's you know, specifications, and then I'm gonna try to put the personality into it. It's, it's just not gonna work. If you start with like, uh, for instance, we were talking about the Jester. Um, 
archetype earlier, if you know what a gesture sounds like and what your brand is going to sound like, and you start from that starting point, it's going to be that much easier to get your message across. Uh, the second one, don't write about your product's features, but instead of write about the benefits of using it, the Apple example is perfect. Um, you know, they could have talked about the features, but instead they focused on what the benefit of those features were. Um, the next one is KISS. This is my version of it. Keep it short, stupid. Uh, when you write too much, people lose focus, especially with social media and stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, brevity is really important. I mean, it, it's, it's a good idea if you find that your writing's too long to kind of get your ideas out. And then go back, uh, you know, write, write, and rewrite the next one for um, to shorten it. Because you'll find that in each revision, it's like, okay, I could have said that in fewer words, right? Or I'm really trying to say this, which can be said much simpler. Um, and finally, my last piece of advice is to learn your uh, platforms and research appropriate styles. The difference between LinkedIn and Instagram is massive, right? Instagram can oh, yeah. be very carefree, be fun. You can do shorthand. Uh, you don't always need a caption. LinkedIn is business oriented. Right, you need to be professional. People assume that you're professional. So if you're not, it's going to hurt you. Um, the difference between putting out a press release and an email is massive and require totally different writing styles. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're writing for something that you're not familiar with, you should put in a little bit of research at the forefront. Uh, it doesn't take much. A lot of you know the stuff is available on Google. Yeah, or, um, or con contact a content writer. A yeah. Copywriter. And so to kind of show this, um, we've we've created an example of uh, of what bad and good copy look like. Uh, let's imagine that you work for, try to pick the most boring product we can think of. Imagine you work at Fold Out Tables USA and you're selling white fold out tables. Uh, and they come up to you and they say, hey, you know, look, we're selling to businesses left and right. We have no problem getting these in offices, but uh, we're just not reaching that young demographic. Uh, can you write us an ad and, and you know, sell to young people? So with that in mind, I was like, okay, well, what's the first thing that most people do when they start writing an ad is they just start listing the specifications. Our six foot fold out table can accommodate up to 350 pounds, is made from durable aluminum, and is perfect for indoor or outdoor situations. This is bad copy because it only speaks to the person who is looking for a six foot fold out table that can accommodate up to 350 pounds. You can put on the table. If someone doesn't really care, you know, if there's, I'm just looking for something, yeah. like none of that, it's, it's all, it's all nonsense and there's no, there's no message to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not short, uh, there's no tone or voice or personality behind it. It's just, it's hard to feel anything when you read that. Uh, so then I thought about the good copy and it's like, I started thinking, it's like, man, I've never been to a party that didn't have a white fold out table. And not only that, but uh, it is almost always the center of the party. People are either playing games on it, they're putting their drinks on it, but people hang out around these white fold out tables. So boom, it's the center of the party. Yeah. Hell, it's, it holds 350 pounds. You can take a nap on it. Yeah. So, yeah right. People are probably passing out on yeah, it. Yeah, take a nap. Uh, but here's the thing, though. Without the visual element, if I just put out now, it said it's the center of the party. It's like, what? What, what are you is, talking yeah. about? That doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, so that's that's why it's like I'm having to lean on my my graphic designer, you know, my my media expert to create, uh, you know, a visual that is going to give these words context and vice versa. Um, which is the next thing we'll talk about. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the essential elements of design and branding. Um, first and foremost, these are also all in my voice. This is not from anywhere. This is these are my five tips for anyone trying to <laughs> do their own branding. Um, number one, if it was included in the first set of fonts in Microsoft 2001, don't use it. If I see you with Papyrus, I'm going to call you out. <laughs> Papyrus, Comic Sans, awful, curly. Don't use it. It, it, it just like I, I know it's like something we're comfortable with, and if you're not a creative, it might just seem whatever. But it's it has a time limit, and also if younger people see it, it they associate it with something more fun and not as professional. So if you're using some of those fonts, it makes graphic designers like whew, yeah. because it's just you could rep be representing your brand so much better if you just were to do a little research on fonts. Font choice is incredibly powerful. It is just as much a visual element as oh, it yeah. is part of the writing. I mean, it will say so much. The difference between sans serif and serif is massive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't know what sans serif is. Well, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the big difference. Um, second thing on the list, um, design trends are cool, but try not to center your entire brand around them. Um, if you focus too much on an on annual 
on an annual trend, uh, your brand may become dated. So for instance, like this year versus last year, last year, geometric design was something huge. Um, we actually, we've been doing the branding for Innovate South. Um, so if you compare Innovate South's branding from last year to this year, this year there's a lot more gradients. Um, but the way that we set up the branding initially is it can be, it can be act, like these annual trends can accent no matter how you put it. So, but we didn't design Innovate South with a trend in mind. Right, timeless um, elements. Timeless things, exactly. Um, third thing, when choosing images with people, try to be diverse and inclusive to all people in and out of your de demographic. Uh, keep in mind that you are, you're marketing to people, humans, you know, like, and just try to like fill in the scope, you know, like try to keep everyone included. Yeah, you'll, you'll never market to race. You'll never have access to that demographic information and it's gonna be yeah. misleading if you do. Yeah. I, just you're, you're, you're trying to connect with people. People. Um, okay, um, fourth on the list, keep your color palette super simple. Um, your brand's color palette, let me back up. Keep your color palette super simple and consistent. Should have put consistent. Um, your brand's color palette should have one to three main colors uh, and a main with a small assortment of like accent colors to help create hierarchy. You know, like if you wanna have a rainbow, go for it. I'm not saying you have to pick three, but it has to be consistent throughout. And you, and you wanna keep those three main colors always on your social feed, like all your text, um, but you all also have this assortment of accent colors on the side. Um, and fifth, be inspired, but don't over-design. You might have to do it again. So like most of you, uh, I have a Pinterest. <laughs> um, so there will be times I'm like trying to brainstorm, like, oh, getting some inspiration, you know, and I'll grab some things and I'm like, okay, let me pull all these things. And then at the end of it, it might look not great, you know, and then I have to start all over because I just did too much, you know, so pull inspiration and just kind of grow from there and like have, I, I, if anyone does anything in Adobe Illustrator, I almost always have multiple artboards. Uh, created our canvases uh, for people who don't know what that is and I'll like slowly I'll work on multiple things at once um, rather than just boom. Um, so to play on Michael's um, bad copy good copy bad cop good cop um, <laughs> these are the this is the imagery that I pulled up the that is really a differentiating factor um, so on the left we have there, we'll put the copy with it. Um, we have the Costco, Amazon definition, like, oh my God. The, the most uninspired the most series uninspired, catalog. Yeah, of all exactly. Time. Most uninspired uh, thing you could see. This is not a sexy table. It's just not I don't a want table. that table. No, it's, it, it, it's lame. It's floating. Um, but on the right, we have a party going on, and we have this guy throwing a beer pong ball. You know, these girls are having a blast, not wearing masks. I'm going to point that out. Uh, <laughs> but they're having a great time. This is pre-COVID. Um, but but as you yeah, see, this is, definitely pre this is a party, and literally in the middle of the party is uh, this table and a fold out table. Yeah, and probably at the at, at when kids see this or college kids see this, they're going to go and buy one of these fold out tables. I mean, yeah, if you were to run this as an ad on a Thursday or Friday with a twenty percent off discount and market it to young people, I promise, come Saturday, that you'd be selling some tables. You know, it's very easy to insert yourself in this in this photo. And it's also, you know, we've kind of all been in in a situation that's like this. So it's super easy to conceptualize. Yeah. Um, on top of that, you know, you're, you're just getting the attitude of the brand front and center. You know, it's it's not about a boring yeah. table. It's it's they're trying to connect you with experiences. This would be a brand that's more about pursuing connection. Right. Yeah. Uh, and this is a, this is just a good exercise that we do every now and then just to kind of like we market random things yeah. and we thought it'd be a good idea if you guys were to do something similar. Yeah, so we want you guys to spend a few minutes using the brand archetype that we just discussed earlier, um, your chosen item from the I Spy exercise and some of the things that we had discussed above to create one set of uh, bad and good content. Um, I want you to start with the bad content first because mm -hmm. I know anytime I put on the spot creatively, there's a lot of anxiety. So imagine you're gonna put out the worst piece of content ever. Like if this went out on, on social media, it's like, oh, people are gonna hate it. Like, this is gonna hurt me kind of thing. Really, really start like, just do it. Just what is the worst thing that you can do? And then I want you to make the good version of that, right? Mm -hmm. so using the same object. Using the same object. Yeah. 
And the object can be an inspiration. It doesn't have to include the object, right? Uh, we don't need to see a pink fish next to coffee, but you know, you're talking about squishy and you know, caring and fun yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. I, yeah, it, it just, this is just an example of like taking a step back from what you assume your brand is and how people see it to like practicing like, I don't know, like selling yourself or just like giving another people, people another perspective to see you. Right, right. Yeah. And we'll do it with y'all if you want. <laughs> remember, you, know, you got to focus on the tone first of, of that archetype. And, and you want to, you know, start with the personality and then kind of go from there. And it, it's easy to do. Um, let's see. Let's, let's say, for instance, we were talking about, uh, let's do a lover ar archetype. Okay. Because that one's, you know, I think to me, I think that's kind of a, a difficult one to conceptualize. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, I want to do the, the, the clown corn. <laughs> okay. The lover clown corn. <laughs> and let's, let's do makeup. Okay. Okay. Wow. Because I mean, here's the thing: <laughs> makeup and makeup and clown. Never that, thought Mike would ever pick makeup. <laughs> <laughs> well, the bad copy writes itself. I also don't know anything about makeup, so sure. let's see how this goes. I mean, uh, the worst version of that I'm thinking is somebody a photo of somebody that has your makeup products on that unintentionally looks like a clown. Yeah, they and just really overdid it. Yeah, it just it's just it is awful looking. Uh, and then the description would what? It'd probably be listing the products, and you just created a hit list of all the products to avoid. To avoid, oh, uh, you know, it's it's like if you sent that, out, it's like okay, yeah. well now I know one that this brand is not in tune with what I yeah. want, but two, yeah, and they in, oh sorry, hurt their products. Yeah, you know? and in that case, like the lover archetype thought like oh sensual. Like we want to really show everything, but it, it kind of like faltered. It, it, yeah, it, it faltered. Yeah. Instead, you know, let's focus on uh, maybe sort of the more, I don't know, intimate side or empathetic side of it. I mean, yeah. that, you know, well, there's a few things you can do with that. You can be sensual, but like not just tone it down, man. You know. Yeah. What I'm so how would you take the clown uh, visually? Visually, yeah. How do we turn oh, that? Oh God. Something? Um. Well, okay. Still a clown face. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but half. Half. half of it and so it's caked on like the bad the bad face. side but the other side is like much more refined and maybe the copy could be like you're only it, as good it as looks your... like good makeup yeah it's good makeup it's like it's you're only as good as your tool so maybe it's yeah. like yeah that would be the copy right yeah something like that I like that yeah and this clown is just and so <laughs> things like that it's like you know it shows that it's like obviously your brand cares about uh the performance of you know their products but also they're aware that it's like there are bad products out there that can, you know, affect, and they're, they're, they're basically trying to extend that, that branch. Um, has anyone written any bad copy or good copy that they'd like to share? I know it's kind of hard to put yourself on, on the spot, know. especially with stuff you just created. Or does anyone need any help? We, we wouldn't mind pulling someone up on, oh, yeah, that'd to be chat super fun. and we can, we can do the same <laughs> exercise with your brand or product. If not, we can give you guys just a few more minutes. <laughs> There's nothing happening in the chat for the Q and A's, but we scared uh, them away. I'll keep an eye on it. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, if y'all come up with something, well, it's just a fun exercise. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge. I don't know. Alex has just suggested doing this I Spy thing when we were uh, creating this workshop, and I was like, yeah, this is <laughs> this is it. So much fun. <laughs> I need to go and find my old I Spy books. Um, all right. Well, sit on that, and you guys have our information. So if you want to reach out to us, we can. Mm -hmm. oh nope yep okay so we've kind of walked through you know your brand coming up with a good brand identity or at least having a good idea of what they sound look like um their voice uh, we've gone through that creative process and what it means to create content in a creative way that's thoughtful and keeps that brand identity in mind um but now it's like okay how do we turn that into a process, right? How do I collaborate with creative people in a way that is meaningful and will allow me to, you know, continue to make creative things in a timely manner, in a way that pushes my brand forward? What yeah. is the creative language? How do I speak that? And if you have trouble with this, um, it, this, this exercise, it, it just kind of proves like why creatives are so important. Right. And it's also good to recognize that not all creatives are created equally. Right. Yeah. Just because someone is a creative doesn't mean that they can do everything that is creative. Um, you know, I mean, I can't design a graphic to save my life. It's that doesn't true. mean I'm not a creative person, right? Yeah. Doesn't mean that my input isn't <laughs> valid, but it, it, it is a thing, right? right? And so it's important whenever you're starting a project um, or, you know, trying to create anything that uh, you take inventory if their creativity aligns with your needs. 
um, like I was saying, like, don't ask me to, to make, don't hire me a copywriter to design, you know, a, a brochure. I can write the brochure, but I'm, I'm not going to be able to design it for you. I had a typo on my slide, so don't, <laughs> <laughs> just don't. Right. <laughs> and another thing is that valid creative input is good and it should be encouraged. Like I said, you know, I'm not a designer, but like, I definitely want to give my input on something like when we're making that. Uh, fold out table ad, you know, it's important that your creatives can also communicate with each other. Or if you're not necessarily um, a visual creative and you're trying to work with yeah. a team that you can communicate with them. However, it has to be constructive and it has to push the project yeah. forward. And that's also where these archetype descriptors would be very handy that we gave you all earlier. Like if you were uh, like a jester um, archetype um, enjoyment fun, like having those components really help like bridge the gap between creatives and non-creatives um, to help you like just figure out what you're trying to, to invoke or is that the word? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it works. See, copywriter, no idea. Um, so an ideal creative team, what does that really look like? Vectors. They're all no, yeah, cartoons. They're not real people. Yeah. No, it's kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. So uh, you, you're going to have some kind of brand manager and you know, that doesn't necessarily have to be a title, but it's going to be the person who has the vision and a strong understanding of the brand. They don't even necessarily need to be a creative person, right? They just need to be a good, um, they need to really understand what the brand is trying to say, um, what you're really trying to accomplish besides increasing revenue and sales, um, and just sort of have that critical eye that allows them to, to manage projects. Um, oh, we got a bad oh, copy. Hang on, wait, let's, let's revisit uh, this. Julia says, bad copy. An on-site catering company focuses on saying what they are what they are only rather than the experience they provide for the clients through their services. What would you recommend? What would I recommend as, as the good version of that? So, say, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think honestly, like, if I was to make something good, I mean, you just focus on like, what is the benefit of providing on-site catering? It's like, I mean, you don't have to, you know, you can, you can focus on the party. You can focus on the event. Like we've got the food covered. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You want to kind of sell the experience and like the ease of like being, them being on site yeah. for sure. I, I think of, so the first thing I think of when I think of hosting an event and, and I like cook for people, cause you know, I like to cook big meals and stuff it, doing the dishes after. Oh God. Sucks. And it takes <laughs> like hours. So, you know, you could do a fun ad where it's like somebody like washing it like an endless yeah. pile of dishes, right? And it's like, hey, you can avoid this. So like, you have a good we, experience even after, even after right. the party's over. We've got it covered. You yeah. know, focusing on the on the benefit of, of what your catering company is providing. That's good. That's good advice. Um, does that kind of help help you out? Uh, if it doesn't, feel free to shout at us. And I, I think to piggyback on that, Michael, it's yeah. it's selling the experience, like you were saying, but it, you're talking to the party host. So maybe yeah. something like you can enjoy your own party. I mean, they never uh, do it's really when you're yeah. a party. Well, yeah. I think, I mean, that's something I think you guys do really well with, with Hamper, uh, mm -hmm. Laurel, is that like, you don't just market it as like, okay, it's, you know, it's drop off laundry service. It's, it's so much more than that. That first ad that you put out for, for instance, Oh, well, that's my wonderful marketing team at Rap. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. How, how did the, it was the video, right, of, of you just like worn out, like surrounded by laundry, like <laughs> overrun by laundry, uh, which I think, you know, every mom in America has found yeah. something. I like. love the video, Milo, just like running around and you just, and just like, piling more. Yeah. And it's like, man, I wish there was an easier way to yeah. do this. And it's like, hey, you don't have to do your own laundry anymore, right? Yeah. Like, enjoy enjoy your party. You. Yeah. yeah. Thank, yeah, that's great. Thanks uh, for that uh, question. If you guys have any more that you want to send or any questions about anything we've discussed, like, please feel free to, uh, to continue sending us messages. Um, so back to the ideal creative team. So we have the brand manager who's, you know, basically orchestrating the things, you know, they might, they might be the person that's like, okay, I got an idea here or whatever. The ideal guy. The ideal guy. Um, you're going to need a copywriter, uh, a good writer who understands the brand's personality, right? Um, you're going to need a graphic designer. Uh, Imaginative artists who can visualize broad concepts, extremely talented, good with pets. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> no. It kind of looks like me. It kind of looks like uh, me. Weird. Um, and then some media expert, so a talented photographer, videographer, um, you know, somebody who works with, with a media that can gather yeah. brand resources. So good photos that match your brand identity and stuff like that. 
Um, you kind of look like the media expert. <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> bit. Uh, so that's the ideal creative team. But you know, you may not. You may be a one-person show. That's super common, and we deal with that a lot uh, whenever we're consulting with people. Uh, and a lot of people ask us, like, okay, well, what can we do to yeah. to make this content? You know. So if you're not uh, a copywriter by trade, um, these are three websites that, that work pretty well for it. Fiverr and Upwork are great for um, contracting freelancers. Um, you can like look at you know their, their past work and you get kind of a hands-on look at, at the sort of work that they do. You can find somebody who works something with you like in your, your field or whatever your service is um, and kind of hunt it down to that. Text broker is more for batch services. Um, it's particularly good for product descriptions. So if you have an e-commerce store or something uh, like that. Um, quickly about the copywriter, uh, it's good to lean on your friends, you know, if you have like a talented friend, but there is a big difference between a good writer and a good copywriter. Yeah. Right? If some, if you had a friend who published a book, like, yeah, hey man, they might be a good writer, but there is a sort of level of strategy and appreciation that comes to copywriting that yeah. you know may not be found there so it's just something to keep in mind the same goes for graphic design you know i've had a lot of friends or classmates who oh, please don't do that again <laughs> i've had a lot of classmates who are like oh alex you do graphic design can you make uh, a billboard or can you like do this for me without giving me much context of their brand and and they they try to like try to explain to me, but I don't know. I, I, I don't do everything. That's the thing. Right. I love doing infographics. I love doing packaging. I love doing these things and, and I can help out someone if they need it. Um, but also if there's any graphic designers out there, it's really important to like, to, to, to stand your ground, you know, and like make a contract, even if you know, them, you know, it's good to, uh, to, to show what you're worth, you know, yeah. tell people what you're worth. But if you are trying to do these things on your own, if you're like getting started on your own, you really can't afford helping or you really can't afford hiring a, a graphic designer. Fiverr and Upwork is also a great place to kind of put out like looking for someone to help me do this. Mm -hmm. And if you're really trying to do it on your own, Canva actually is a pretty good, I hate to say it, was a pretty good option. Um, they have a lot of assets in there and like animations that actually do pretty well on, on social media. Um, media experts um, will, if you don't have one of those, Shutterstock, Adobe Stock, and Unsplash are, are pretty good. Do you want to yeah. talk about those a little bit? Yeah, sure. So Shutterstock and Adobe Stock uh, do require a license. Um, I think Shutterstock is the cheaper of the two. Um, Adobe Stock's a little more expensive, but you get, um, you know, higher quality. Less stock. Shutterstock looking images. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, hey, there's an art to picking stock images, right? Real. Like, you, you know, you don't want your brand to become, okay, wait, this is just, I've seen this stock image guy before mm -hmm. on other brands. Yeah. So, you know, you, you should put in some effort and actually Unsplash, the yeah. next one is, um, is a new one that's free. And it particularly, it looks like, I don't think mm -hmm. it would look like, stock images at all because yeah. brands will promote them to put you know their stuff mm -hmm. in the background of shots and stuff so it looks yeah. more like a real scene. and if your archetype is let's say hero and you value candace like being candid you might just do well just doing these pictures yourself and like just showing like behind this like with an iphone or something you know just to get started um yeah michael's gonna talk about the creative timeline yeah and so this isn't meant to be like a functional uh creative timeline necessarily. It's just to illustrate that there is a, an iterative process to creating uh, anything with a team. Um, so you're always going to start with an objective. Uh, this is where your objective would be like, hey, we're going to increase sales and revenue for, you know, for this, because it's not necessarily really branding. It's a sales objective. Um, then you formulate a strategy, right? And that strategy is going to determine, you know, who does what, how do we do it? What does our, our funnel look like? Um, a marketing funnel or a creative funnel is uh, basically the, the hierarchy of who starts the project, who does it go to next, who does it go to after that, and so on and so forth. And they can be kind of flexible. At, at Rally Marketing, when we create something, it almost always starts with writing. Mm -hmm. It then gets into graphics so that they can uh, create a graphic for what we've written. And then it goes to our account manager who reviews it for that. They're our brand manager, essentially. They review yeah. it for the brand. Does it make sense, right? Um, they give us our feedback. And then it goes back uh, through us again so that we can uh, edit it. So step three, right? We just talked about the creative, create content. That's that whole funnel I just discussed. Step four, you have to refine your content, right? The whole reason that it goes to the AE and then back to us is because, you know, 
not everything is, is, is going to be right the first time. You know, I, I make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. And having, you know, people in place to catch that is going to make, make sure that you're not putting out something that could harm your brand or, you know, your brand identity. And then finally, you need to publish your content and monitor it. If you're just publishing it and never oh, looking yeah. at it again, you're not doing it. Monitoring is like the key word. Right. You have no idea yeah. what it's, mm -hmm. you know, how successful it is if you're not going and looking at like the metrics and stuff. Yeah. And if you run like a business through social uh, media, you have access to this information. Yeah, um, that's something y'all should really do research on if you're trying to like, I mean, Instagram, you see likes, you know, or Facebook, you see likes. But there are some things that you really can't see unless you have these like things put in place on your website yeah. um, that really could tell you a lot about um, how your customer like interacts with your brand. Right. Like personally. one of the most telling things is if we create a post and it has a ton of views, but no one liked it, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, maybe our strategy was right because it reached the people that we wanted to reach, but maybe on the creative side, you know, that we, we messed up somewhere because people aren't engaging with it. Mm -hmm. on, on the opposite end, we might put out something where only, I don't know, 30 people see it, but all 30 people like it. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> you know, I'd rather that than mm -hmm. 100 people seeing it and not interacting with it. Yeah, we got bots. But it shows that, okay, maybe the strategy was off from the beginning, you know, and it's that sort of stuff that allows you to continue to be creative in a way that's, that's meaningful. Um, and so we have a bit of an exercise. This is not an unfinished slide. This is how we intended it to work. <laughs> uh, kind of what we just gone over, like what what do you guys think are the do's and don'ts of creative collaboration? Like what is the worst thing that you could tell, you know, a graphic designer or a copywriter when you're trying to get something done? Don't make it pop. Don't yeah. make it pop. Yeah, saying like make it pop or like <laughs> I want this to, whoa, yeah. I want it to be front and yeah. center. You know, it's like that. It's not really telling us what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any any ideas for, you know, for like what is a good collaboration advice versus bad or? Um, I, so have I, some. I have some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we yes. People to, to jump in. Never, ever say slap it together. <gasps> yeah. Oh, <laughs> just get it done. Oh, oh, yeah. And I have found too, like you mentioned this earlier, context is key. Um, mm. You can't just give someone fragmented information and think that they're going to understand what you're trying to do with it. And just because something looks good doesn't mean it's practical application will make sense. So understanding, is it a billboard? Is it a digital ad? Um, where it's going to be used? And then conveying that to the team, that's what you need to do. It's not just, oh, I'm, I just need ads. Well, what kind of oh, ads? Yeah. Really yeah. The point, you know? Yeah. And, and that's clarity and context is, is important. Absolutely. And I think that's sort of the value of those those brand archetypes and the words that went with them is like you can tell, you know, your copywriter like, hey, the voice of this is going to be uh, what were some of the things that we said, like inspiring, daring, brave, mm -hmm. right? That gives your creative team actually a lot of yeah. like, headroom. You know, you're starting them off on a good foot, but then you got to be a little more specific that than that and say like this is their service, stuff like that. Oh, yeah, you definitely. Yeah. So yeah. sort of the bare minimum of these descriptions, but like actually saying what your goal is as a company definitely needs to needs to be a do <laughs> and like maybe your your goal like where you want to be in like a year or so you know definitely helps us kind of get you there yeah one you touched on earlier was making a contract oh yeah you need to make a contract as a creative person that's some, a mistake i made if you're uh, a freelance if you're doing freelance but i i can't really give much uh, uh advice on that it, it, I can give. I can tell you to do it, <laughs> but there are some people out there who can give you better resources. But I, it's so important to make a contract because it's always like, oh, can you make this for me? Sure, but then you go over time, or they it becomes much more complicated. Yeah, don't ever just let a friend oh. say like, hey, hey, I'll pay you know, yeah, I'll pay a couple hundred bucks to like yeah. do this for me, and yeah. just take them at their yeah. word. It's less of a legality thing. Like you don't want to get legal with your friend, but like yeah. just to keep the the scope of the project. Yes like centered yeah because like oh well if you look at the contract i said this yeah yeah uh Kirstie Kirstie has a don't well you could just oh, photoshop yeah. that out right oh yeah. my god sure for you know 10 extra hours but also it's not gonna look good everyone yeah. <laughs> like, right yeah well i mean so there are some things photoshop can do let me tell you but like a whole person no <laughs> yeah it's it, it they know although if you can't crop it you can't photoshop it Oh, wow, Ryan, play that. <laughs> <laughs> and so a good thing to, to keep in mind uh, with all this is that basically, I mean, we're, we're people, right? Like mm -hmm. 
we're not just machines that can turn on creativity yeah. on and off. So when you ask us to Photoshop something out, out, it's like, okay, we can probably do it in however many hours it'll take, yeah. but that is, you know, depending on how much we're yeah. being built for or yeah. how much budget the project has is going to take away from yeah. other resources. Also uh, one, one way you can go for creative rather than saying like, can you just Photoshop it, go and say, I think this part of the image is distracting. What can you do to help with that? Yeah. You know, um, don't ask for discounts because you know, because you know them personally, dude, um, so no, rude. Yeah. If you, if you, <laughs> if you respect me as a friend, right. Yeah. And you, you're coming to me cause you value my expertise then treat me like, you know, like I deserve to be treated. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That is one of the worst things you can, you can do. It's, it's another thing, you know, if you offer to somebody as the creative, like that's, that's awesome. Right. That's a good thing to, to do for somebody you care about, but on the receiving end, it's, it's really demotivating. It's, yeah. It's kind of complicated too, to yeah. do all that, like on a business side. Yeah. Just do stay clear, stay concise. And just, yeah. If you take the terms that we told y'all at the beginning, like with your archetypes, then it'll be a lot easier to, to get what you want at the end of it for sure. Exactly. And the next one. Yeah. And so, whoop. Whoop. So the next thing uh, we want to talk about um, as we begin to wrap this up is that, you know, as we discussed earlier, branding, I mean, it's an art form and it's something that you can spend your whole life studying and continuing to learn. Uh, there's far more than we could ever cover in one workshop, let alone 50 workshops. Um, these are some uh, resources that that we uh, have have studied, you know, that, that have been helpful for us. Um, Story brand is the first one. Uh, this is something we actually use at Rally Marketing. Um, this, Have you ever heard Rodney talk? He, he probably talked about He's the story talked about Yeah, well, because it's a great idea, right? It is right? great, yeah. It basically flips the script on what we just learned, right? We've been talking about uh, very much like your brand is the center, uh, you know, is the hero of of the, the story that you're creating and stuff. And that's not a bad place to start, but this does the opposite and it makes your customer the hero mm -hmm. and your brand is there to guide them. So, you know, if your brand archetype is an outlaw, they may not be the outlaw of, you know, they may not be the hero necessarily under mm -hmm. a story brand, right? They might just be there to show them. It's like, hey, man, I can help you get out of this pit through some, you know, some exciting adventure kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? Um, it's based off of um, off of uh, what's called story circle, which is uh, earlier I touched on this, how all stories sort of follow a pattern. Um, there's a scholar who figured out that um, that basically all Western stories tend to follow the same exact like. There's a person, he has a problem, he meets a guide, the guide helps them overcome it. They then uh, like battle with, the, with their issue, with the power that they learn from their guide, and then they bring that solution back to, the, uh, back to where they started mm -hmm. to like better the world around them. Yeah. So it takes that same principle because it's super easy to understand. Yeah. Is that the one Dan Harmon used? Yeah, Dan Harmon uses yeah. it for community uh, and Rick and Morty I think is the other one. Mm -hmm. um, He's done a lot. I mean, anything. Name, name a movie, and I promise you it follows this script. Star Wars, every single Star Wars movie well, relax. does that. Slow down. <laughs> uh, <Yep. laughs> so it's a very powerful tool, and it's very easy to understand. It's written in a way that's super simple. It's a great next step for branding. Um, the next one was one that Jeremy Bate and I forgot who? Tara. Tara, yeah, uh, covered in their talk. Um, it's one that I, you know we've uh, seen before, and it's basically like, yeah, but why are you doing this? Uh, and it's an iterative technique designed to better define cause and effect relationships. You know, it's like, I think what was the example they used? It was, uh, their, their whole talk was on uh, UX and UI and yeah. like it's user centric or consumer centric stuff. Um, I can't think of the example. Specifically. It was, it was with ice, right? It's like, I want crushed ice in the morning. It's like, why? It's like, because I like to make smoothies. It's like, well, why, why do you like to make smoothies? It's like, because I like to have a healthy, you know, yeah. breakfast. And it's like, well, why do you like to have a healthy breakfast? It's like, because I want to live a healthy lifestyle. Because I want to live a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. And all of a sudden you've taken your product, right? Which is started as like an ice crusher and like a refrigerator and you've developed it into, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, well now we can model this around helping people achieve a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. It's it's that much more powerful. Uh, and it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there on this one as well. So it's, it's worth checking out. And I, I don't read much, but I do watch Netflix. I watch me some Netflix. Um, and one of my favorite things to watch on Netflix is this uh, series called Abstract, which each episode focuses on 
people who not only do uh, these certain creative um, in, like or in these like specific creative fields, but they do it really well. Uh, so yeah. there's someone who does topography. There's the guy that invented uh, or just designed the first, I think, Air Jordans, or yeah. I think, and it, one it, of them is about the rebranding process of Instagram. Yeah. Which yeah, is really which cool. is a user interface and user experience. So I, I, I like to watch that stuff to get inspired um, personally. And I mean, I, I also follow Chris Doe on Instagram. He's just a really cool marketing and branding guy. Uh, but yeah, all the, all these things are out there. You just have to go and find them. Yeah. Surround yourself by brands you love. That yeah. was something I, I didn't really understand until I started uh, getting into marketing is that like, you know, we're so we're so inundated with ads that sometimes it's easy to want to ignore them. Oh, yeah. But when you're thinking about it from a critical perspective and you have your own brand to manage, mm -hmm. I mean, go, go follow some big brands on social media and, you know, imitate them as to the best of your ability, as long as they match what your, mm -hmm. you know, your overall brand identity is. Yeah. Well, I think that about covers all the things um, okay. we had. Um, if you guys want to send us an email or connect with us on LinkedIn, if you don't have any questions now, but later, yeah, um, we'd love to hear it. But um, take a screenshot of this, or yeah. write it down, whatever you, you know. You got to send me pictures of your dog. Yeah. Totally cool with that. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions or want us to revisit any section of this uh, presentation? So while oh. we wait for some questions to come in, uh, I have a question. What has been y'all's favorite brand to work on, and why? Like a brand that y'all developed. Ooh, that's a really, I have really, really good I have really, really enjoyed doing Innovate South's branding. Um, personally, uh, yeah, I just you can have a lot of fun with that. I just, it just has a lot of freedom. Um, I actually did, I mean, as Rally, Innovate South, but personally, I did the Rev uh, the packaging, um, like the coffee bags, and that was just a really fun project to uh, work with um, them. It, it was just a really fun project to watch it actually be made, like made and manufactured. Yeah. That was really exciting for me. It's like it was born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> I, I think my favorite. Uh, Best Stop is one of our clients, and that's oh, a Best really Stop. fun one just because I, I can throw around Cajun phrases yeah. left and right, and people get it. Oh, my God, yeah. And the imagery, they have a really good photographer. They, they work with Denny Col Colbert. Col Colbert. Colbert. Uh, Colbert. Colbert is not right. Colbert. I mean, I, I <laughs> but, know, yeah, he's, he's a very amazing photographer uh, based in Lafayette, and – he took a lot of really great pictures that you wouldn't think would come out of like a, a Cajun place, but they, they do really well. They get like 16, they have like 16,000 uh, email subscribers or something crazy like that. And they make like 5,000 like a month or something yeah. like on just emails. I, I think another one. Sorry, we have another sorry. question. I'm so sorry, I'm stepping no, over thing. It. Um, it's from Julianne. She says, Michael, I'm in strategic communications as well. Do you, did you do any internships to find your job at Rally and how did you discover your niche? Before you answer um, that, I do want her to know that your cover letter to Rally was a haiku. And <laughs> it was. Uh, my, the haiku was, a cover letter is too draft for you. Instead, I give a haiku. Uh, it definitely got our yeah. attention. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the point of a cover letter, right? Um, Just being different. The internships that I worked before was actually uh, some of the experience that I, I listed. Uh, Praise on Creative was where I got... Um, my public relations experience that was very hands-on um, and Habitat for Humanity, uh, which were kind of different uh, because Habitat for Humanity, I was kind of like, okay, they basically were like, just do it. Like, we trust you, go for it. Whereas um, Praise on Creative was very much more like a traditional agency where it's like, it multiple. there was a funnel and a yeah. process. Yeah. And uh, my advice, honestly, if you're looking for internships to kind of find that niche, is to try both in-house and agency mm -hmm. and find what, what you like because they're totally different worlds. I happen to thrive in an agency. Um, as far as where I found my niche, I, I really think it was in the last year. I mean, I've, I'd always been a good writer. Um, I'm just kidding. Yeah, he's actually <laughs> a really good writer. <laughs> but in the last like year of college, I, you know, I was like, okay, I, originally, I was like, I think I want to go into the account side of things and focus more on sales. But, you know, I was like, you know, I really just, I like writing and I like the creative side. Uh, and I, I only learned that from doing it. Um, Michael's a very, 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 very good storyteller. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very good at writing. Like, he's just really good at getting the point across in, in a creative way. So yeah. take inventory of your, your strengths, your, your talents, um, even your hobbies. You know, uh, we were talking about me being a good storyteller and I honed a lot of that. I hate, I hate to admit this to 
everyone who's here, but through Dungeons and Dragons. I wasn't going to say it, but I thought it. <laughs> uh, we, we started playing that with friends and it's, like, it's just, it's storytelling. That's all it is, yeah. you know? Uh, and again, that was something I picked up in the last year. So maybe that had something to do with it. It definitely did. Yeah. Yeah. My it's, it's awesome page. I love it. I just stepped on your answer too about the, your favorite brand, so I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was gonna say I like to work on on challenges. So one of the most recent ones I did um, was Continuum Restoration. That was less of a brand and more of like a brand strategy. Um, and that one was really fun because it's restoration and remediation remediation services, which is, um, you know, how do you advertise that in like a a wholesome way? Right, like not in a way like that's like, like way. right, right. And, and on top of that, they're just like, dude, they're awesome. They're like, really get that. It's like, Hey, we're offering people like, it's not about rate shopping. It's not about being the cheapest hurricane chasers. Right. It's like, we're here to like help people pick up the pieces of their life after, you know, like disastrous events, flooding, stuff like that. So it was really fun to get to lean into that. And, and uh, uh, that brings up another question is this process, it will work for B2B and B2C companies. Cause sometimes there's a, product you're like oh this brand's kind of boring but it can yeah. this can still work for that right yeah oh absolutely oh yeah yeah i mean we we showed um like a, a huge assortment of brands that are, are are doing it right in their own way but you know also all those brands didn't get it right the first time you know right and, and i think and really to reiterate this like if you're not starting with that brand voice even if you're not really sure what your brand is but at least what they sound like you're already starting off on the wrong foot. Like if you mm -hmm. start off there and you know, like, okay, like the fold out tables thing is like, well, we got to make this fun, you know, we mm -hmm. need to make this exciting. So like, if you have that to begin with, it's just that much easier to create something that's going to be fun and exciting. Yeah. Why do y'all think so many bigger brands sometimes misstep, especially when it comes to like the political climate and just the, the feeling out there, like when Pepsi had that uh, Kendall Jenner ad. Oh God. That's just too hard. <laughs> I think that is a consequence. So the bigger your brand gets, the more people that are involved, the yeah. more stages of approval it has to go through. There are, you know, you're creating more points of failure, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, you know, that's why a lot of these big brands, they actually hire out small agencies uh, like our size because they're like, you know, our marketing agency, like the in-house Coca-Cola marketing agency might be great at promoting the ads. When it comes to creating them, they're so inundated with different departments and might have 20 different creative directors, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. It just becomes that much harder to create something that is authentic and unique when there's so many hands, too many cooks in the kitchen, essentially. Yeah, when I worked at Hasbro, there were like so many sections. There was yeah. there's family gaming, there's adult gaming, there's uh, My Little Pony has its own section, uh, Star mm -hmm. Wars. And, and in those sections were also other sections and then interns. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's like several, several, and then like a board member for everything. And then there's international. It's like, there's so many moving parts. Yeah. And I, I can't tell you the number of times you've come to the mad where it's like, oh, this is it. This is going to be killer. And yeah. you know, the client or they, the client might have a board member. Yeah. And they're just like, ah, no, don't like it. Let's yeah. do this instead. And yeah. you know, as a creative, it sucks. It sucks to have to like grit your teeth and, and put out something that, you know, isn't as strong as it could have been mm -hmm. because of essentially an approval process that you don't have control of. I think we that have time for one last question. Um, Julianne's asking, can you explain in-house versus agency? Yeah, sure. Yes, you can. Uh, in-house <laughs> in marketing or in-house anything really is uh, you work for a brand, right? So for Habitat for Humanity, I was their PR specialist essentially for, you know, six months or so. Um, that meant I really only had one manager uh, who was also just managing, you know, the Habitat for Humanity chapter. And uh, I would create uh, content, she would approve it. And then that was pretty much it, right? And the thing is with in-house is you're kind of expected to wear a lot of hats. I had to go out and take photos. Uh, I had to mess around with some design stuff. Um, and I also had to write it. Um, some people love that. And I, you know, I did like it. It's, it's a, it's usually a little more laid back too, um, depending on where you work though. Agency is sort of the opposite. You're, you're siloed into like a, like a talent, right? And, you know, a good agency will allow you to step outside that silo. And I think rally, we do a pretty good job of that. You know, we, we allow people to kind of bounce around and do what feels comfortable for them for a project. But at the end of the day, I'm a copywriter. Right, I'm going to show up to work and I'm going to be given projects um, that are taken on by the account manager who deals with the clients. 
specifically. So I never have to interact with the clients. I never have to go and take photos, but they'll give me those resources and say, hey, let's turn this into something, right? Um, once that's done, I send it to Alex and it's, you know, pretty much done until it comes back to me. So that that's that's the difference. An agency is, is you know, you have departments where you have clearly defined roles in-house, you're working for a specific brand. Um, and also agencies, right, you're, you're, you're writing for brands. Brands will hire agencies to work for them uh, instead of having an in-house department. Does that answer? I know it's kind of a long. Yep. She said, gotcha, oh. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, cool. think, um, I think we're winding down. Um, I do have more questions, though. So let me, um, one more? You want to do one more question? Let's do one more. I have one for Alex, actually. How do you stop yeah. your own personal design preferences and bias from entering into your work? Oh, man. That's tough. Um, well, when I when I was started doing freelance, I actually got into that that trouble with that because I was like, I like this, so y'all don't like it. But it, it's just keeping that that narrative open with with your client. Um, and and when you start to do that, and you start to define like their their what they're trying to like get made, like what what they're trying to produce. It kind of like. It helps me figure out like what 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 it is they actually want versus what versus what they're asking for that's a big thing yeah because uh, what they're asking when they're just asking for something and i'm like okay so i guess i'll just do this with what i know and they're like no it's not all we want i'm like okay like, okay let's talk about this let's again. talk about it so yeah. it's just being commu communicative and just being very clear on my end as well that's something i've i've struggled with is just saying like well you're asking for this but what you actually want is this um so, but sometimes they'll like, they'll tell me like, okay, Alex, do what you want. I'm like, you sure about that? Uh, and then I'll just kind of like have fun with it. And they're like, I love it. I'm like, thank God. <laughs> Cause I really just guessed on that one. Um, but yeah. And I also like, I have an outlet, like I do graphic, like I just, if I think of something funny, I'll go and make like, I make tarot cards, like, like on my free time, I just design tarot cards and that kind of helps me. Uh, do my own creative thing rather than implementing it into someone else's. <laughs> Sometimes rally like what I make, so I just have an outlet rally. <laughs> Somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Thank you guys so so much. I think um, we're winding down on time, and uh, I think this will we recorded this, so it should be made available. And uh, we really really appreciate y'all popping in and teaching yeah. everybody hey. about branding and voice. Oh yeah. And again, if you guys have any more questions that we couldn't answer, you know, just email us or, or oh, well, let's send go us a message email. on LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> It'll yeah. have been up there for a while, oh, so okay. if you lost well, it, uh, yeah. Well, thank you everyone again for coming, and we hope we answered all your questions. Um, and thanks for guys listening to us banter, and I hope you have a great Halloween. <laughs>